Formal agenda item. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Valenzuela. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Vice Mayor Pastor. <coughs> Mayor Stanton. Here, we have a quorum present. Now uh, we are lucky to have an interpreter with us today, Ms. Orellana. Would you please introduce yourself for the audience? Yes, Mayor. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Marlene Orellana. Yo soy la intérprete de español. Si en algún momento durante la junta necesita mi asistencia, por favor venga a ver a mí o a cualquier miembro del concilio de la ciudad. Gracias. Thank you so much. Now is the time on our agenda for citizen comments. Citizens have up to three minutes each to provide comments on any subject matter, not on today's agenda. Uh, we will do 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting pursuant to our city council rules. If there are additional folks w wishing to provide citizen comment, we will take time at the end of our meeting to hear those, uh, uh, those comments. The first person to speak under citizen comment is Carlos Garcia, followed by Didi Blase. <clears throat> Mayor uh, Viridiana Hernandez and myself have relating issues. I'm wondering if she could be put uh, next That's to perfectly me. fine. That's great. Thank you. And so what we want to address today, Council Mayor, is the actions that happened last August 22nd when President Trump visited Phoenix. A report came out this week from the, or last week from the Phoenix Police Department, and I think we all heard about six hours of testimony uh, following that matter. Uh, here in council and, and, and how egregious the conduct of the Phoenix police was. Um, and so today we're here um, doing myself, doing a citizen's petition um, regarding the use of chemical weapons. Um, after the report that's come out, over 522 pepper balls were shot at, the, at, at our community. Um, there was pepper spray canisters, there was tear gas, there is an abundance of chemical weapons used on our community. We saw Philadelphia this week. The, the victory uh, spawned uh, a, a, a riot. People were taking out uh, street signs, were taking over the streets. And that's, it's, you know, I'm not saying that was right or wrong, but we saw the Philadelphia Police Department let them be and put the lives of their citizens before uh, the property that was being damaged. Um, and in the case in Phoenix, there was no property being damaged. There was no threat. And yet our community was attacked. Over a thousand people, elderly, young children, uh, and, and members of our community that were peacefully protesting were attacked. And so for us, it's important to remain and be able to protest, especially when our lives and, and our families' lives are under attack uh, by this particular administration. And so uh, I would turn in the citizen petition, um, but it basically we are asking you for an ordinance, resolution, or measure that outlaws Phoenix Police Department's officers to have use of non-lethal chemical weapons, uh, OE, OC, CN, CS, I'm not gonna try to read them, um, at protests and large community events. Um, we ask, as pursuant to Chapter 9, Section 22 of the Phoenix Charter, that this be done or this be take this vote be taken in the next 15 days. Uh, thank you for taking thank this you. this matter into account. And as you stood against or or for community, I think some of the council people were present at the protest that day and saw how we were attacked. Uh, we hope. Uh, that this gets resolved, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Uh, we await Thank you very much. So our city clerk will accept the citizen petition from you. Thank you for submitting that. Ms. Hernandez. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the time to speak, Mayor and City Council. Um, additional to what happened in the, in the hurt that happened, the physical pain and, and the injuries that happened that day because of the weapons used, there was also an extreme dream amount and cost. We just saw with the report that the police department redu um, showed, um, plus the additional cost that we were looking at is that there over half a million dollars was spent and actually closer to a million dollars were spent on this day um, to 
I don't know what what was the purpose right before this presidential rally and campaign rally really. Um, and so the cost that happened and the cost that that endured to us as taxpayers from City of Phoenix are outrageous, um, and it is extremely bothersome when we are constantly being told that there's not enough money for our parks, for our streets, for community centers, for youth programs, when we're spending nearly a million dollars on one day for, a camp for someone's campaign rally. Um, and so to that, to add to a citizen's petition, Ivy Diana Hernandez, resident of the city of Phoenix, petitioned the mayor and council to consider to enact within 15 days a resolution, ordinance, or measure that expeditiously outlaws the funding of city funds, buildings, and staffing resources, including policing for any future visits um, from President Trump. And so for us is that our, we shouldn't be paying for someone's campaign rally, especially if that's taking money away from our safety, from our parks, from our streets. Um, so over half a million dollars that was reported as police cost but nearly a million dollars if you add all the other costs within the campaign, the fire department, and all the other departments that were used. And so we believe that that is unjust and that is definitely not where our tax money should be going. Um, so I will go ahead and submit this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. So our city clerk will accept that citizen petition at this time. Thank you for submitting the uh, petition. Thank you for being here. Next uh, will be Didi Blaze. Is that the correct uh, last name? Didi? Yes, it's Dee Dee Blaze. Hello, I'm Dee Dee Blaze, co-founder of Somos Independence. Somos Independence is a national organization led by Mexican-American women who are independent registered voters, encouraging voting in our national and local elections. We appreciate the mayor of Phoenix's zero tolerance policy on sexual harassment. I understand Kate Gallegos is on the record for um, supporting a zero tolerance policy according to the Associated Press and we appreciate that. And um, that said, and in support of Lydia Hernandez's petition to have Dwight Amory removed from the Maryvale Planning Committee, our organization is asking the Phoenix City Council men and women members to look into our sexual harassment policies. Um, and the reason why is um, Lydia went to file a sexual harassment police report. It took her a whole month and a half because it was considered a level three priority. And we believe that the council members need to upgrade the priority of um, sexual harassment victims because now with regard to the hashtag MeToo movement, uh, women are becoming um, emboldened to find the courage to um, address those who have sexually assaulted them. Um, in my view, this must change, and I am petitioning city council members to look into this policy and upgrade the level of the priority for other hashtag me too sexual harassment victims. I also want to take a moment and hope that the city councilwoman uh, who has endorsed John Gomez for city council district number five will withdraw her endorsement of Gomez since Mr. Amory, who was listed as Gomez's campaign chair, um, is the one who uh, has sexually assaulted Lydia Hernandez. So we do not support Mr. John Gomez, considering that he has a campaign chairman as and he's, he's the one that um, has assaulted several women. Um, these women are coming forward too. That's uh, pretty much it. Zero tolerance means just that, and we hope that you look into the Phoenix Police Department sexual harassment policies. Thank you. I thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, the lack of any response by members of this council it doesn't do with the merits of what you've said, only that under open meeting laws, we can't in any way substantively respond. We take in the testimony, but we can't respond from the dais under open meeting law. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next will be- Mayor, may I ask a question? Councilman Okowski, I think so, go ahead. I'm not sure if it's legal or not, but if there's a commissioner on a village that has- If there's a commissioner on the village that happens to abuse another commissioner during a village meeting, shouldn't we have information on that? Or shouldn't the council be aware of that? 
Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, that's an item we can't <clears throat> discuss um, because it's not agendized, but absolutely we can get information on that. And the council does have authority under the city code to take action against members of boards and commissions. And right. so um, that's a matter for a future agenda, and we can certainly look into it. Councilman Valenzuela. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had a conversation with, uh, with a, a particular board member. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dwight Amory, and uh, he has uh, had we can't, a career. We can't talk. We can't talk about the item uh, from the dais, at least. It's not an agendized uh, item. We, we came into trouble with the open meeting law. So, if you want to issue a statement right after the meeting, uh, you certainly can. But from the dais, we got to be careful here in terms of it's not an agendized item. Mayor, Mayor um, I would like to share as much information as you allowed my my colleague to share. And so, what I want to say is. This particular board member has uh, uh, resigned from all boards and commissions that uh, he is, he currently or had held with the city of Phoenix for what it's worth. Okay, any other information anybody would like to talk about on non agendized items? All right, we'll move on. Marcel uh, Costello. Mayor and City Council, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Marcel Costello. I'm a city, I'm a resident of the city of Phoenix, and I was also an applicant, also an applicant to the Ethics Commission. I am also um, submitting a petition to you today, and I will just read it. Whereas the City of Phoenix Ethics Commission application, this document, for nomination to commission. Instructions, page two, summary of nomination process, item five states, public notice. The board announces the names of the applicants to be interviewed and invites oral or written public comment regarding their qualifications. Whereas the city of Phoenix, same application, ethics commission application for nomination to commission. Instructions, page two again, summary of nomination process states and item seven, interviews. Subject to applicable rules, the applicant is interviewed in public session. After all interviews are completed, the board, which, which excuse me, is referencing the Judicial Selection Advisory Board, discusses the relative qualifications of all the applicants. Voting to determine the nominees to be submitted to the City Council is conducted in public session. Whereas public noticing inviting oral or written public comment regarding the Ethics Commission did not occur, per, whereas the agenda, meeting results, and minutes documents for the Judicial Selection Advisory Board's meetings pertaining to the Ethics Commission nomination process do not make clear whether or not voting to determine the Ethics Commission nominees was conducted in public session. Pursuant to Chapter 4, Section 22 of the Phoenix City Charter, I, Marcel Costello, a citizen and resident of the City of Phoenix, hereby petition the City Council to consider and enact within 15 days the Mayor's and City Council's public response during a formal City Council meeting as to why, one, oral or written public comment was not invited regarding Ethics Commission applicants' qualifications, two, why Ethics Commissioners Applic ethics Commission applicants were not interviewed in public session, and three, whether or not the voting by the JSAB, the Judicial Selection Advisory Board, on Ethics Commission applicants to select the nominees was conducted in public session. That's not clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our city clerk will accept that petition from you. Thank you for taking the time to come down and provide that testimony. Next will be Miss Lydia Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Madam uh, Vice Chair, members of the City Council, my name is Lydia Hernandez and I'm a member of Con City Council District 5. I come before you regarding your recently proposed zero tolerance on sexual harassment policy um, that Kate Gallegos brought forward to the Council and as a woman and as a victim of sexual assault and sexual harassment, I commend Councilwoman Gallego for her leadership as she's absolutely correct. 
um, that all victims feel uh, have, have a right to be heard. I also commend uh, Councilman Valenzuela for the requested added language to address not only elected officials, but also boards and commissions, because although there is a difference in power, the sexual harassment or sexual assault is the same regardless of who the perpetrator is. For the record, Councilwoman Pastor and Councilwoman Valenzuela are familiar with the situation as the individual in question was very, uh, very well known to them. Uh, furthermore, the sexual harassment was also apparent and recognized by city staff while a Weed and Seed uh, conference in 2009 with Maryville PD in Neighborhood Services. Uh, it, is also, it was also at the time addressed by former now retired Commander Hampton at the time as he was serving as a board member to the organization that employed me. Um, currently, and I come before you today, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the City Council, uh, to request the removal of Mr. Dwight Amory from the current Maryville Village Planning Chair position. He violated the City Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Ethics Manual, which is used in trainings for City Commissioners and Board Members. The City of Phoenix Ethics Manual is part of the City of, uh, City of Phoenix policy, and it states that it, uh, it is here to uphold, promote, and demand the highest standards of ethics from all its employees uh, and officials, whether elected or appointed. Uh, furthermore, that it uh, to keep away from improprieties in their roles as public servants and never to use their city position or powers for improper personal gain. Uh, it also addresses discrimination and sexual harassment. I, with all due respect, bring this to your attention as the chair of this committee abused this power in changing meeting dates for, for the committees. When I came forward with my complaint, he selected a date that would conflict with my school board meeting. He did so unbeknownst to the committee and I did inform staff. Um, in December of 2017, when I came forward yet again, this time by a, a public and very widely distributed press release, the city of Phoenix removed me from committee membership at the last hour. I sent my complaint in writing to the city of Phoenix at 11 a.m. Staff called me to confirm my attendance at 11.30, and then again at 2 p.m., and then a venue change. At 2.30 p.m., then finally removed by 4 p.m. Uh, by the mayor's office, according to staff. They cited non-attendance, thus the retaliation. You see, the city of Phoenix kept me on its board roster as a member for five years for, of non-attendance. And it wasn't until I filed a formal complaint that it removed me um, in a policy, uh, it needs to be supported. It, they remove you in a matter of hours. On that day, uh, the perpetrator was uh, supported and not the victim. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, I ask once again for Amory's removal in support of the City of Phoenix Ethics Manual and the city's commitment uh, for zero tolerance policy and furthermore, in support of women like myself who have found the strength to confront their perpetrators. Uh, council members, no one deserves to be touched, groped, forced. Uh, and sexually, you know, forced to sexual hugs and sexually assault, assaulted against their will repeatedly, as I was in the scope of my work. I have filed char charges for sexual assault with the City of Phoenix PD. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez, for that important uh, testimony. The next, oh, all right, so I think we're at our fifth. I think we're much. I right, think we're much, uh, Mr. Venn. I don't know. If maybe someone could get the. I don't think. It, I think the meeting is being televised and being shown on Channel 11. I think for some reason that particular uh, television is not working. The other members uh, of the public are here for public testimony under our city council rules. We have 15 minutes now. We, we reserve additional time at the end. So at this should, we think it should be a short meeting today and you'll have the opportunity to provide public testimony at the end of the regular agendized uh, items. Next on the agenda are uh, the city clerk will please read the 24 uh, hour. I think they're going to, I think they're going to try to Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vent. I think we're going to try to fix it right now. I appreciate your comments. I think we're going to think we're going to try to get the television uh, working. <laughs> Mr. Vent, I think that the meeting is being televised around the City of Phoenix via Channel 11. I think it's a, that particular uh, TV for some reason not working. Are we going to? The meeting is a legal meeting. We're going to continue with the meeting. Uh, City Clerk, would you please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore made by 
may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6412 through 6418, S44247 through 44257, resolutions number 21611 through 21614. Okay. But it is, it is. Okay. All right, we're going to now move on to the meeting minutes. Uh, Councilman Stark, you have a chance to review the formal meeting minutes for January 10th, 2018. Yes, Mayor, I have, and I move approval. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We're on TV. Councilman Williams, did you have a chance to review the formal meeting minutes from December 13th, 2017? I did and moved their approval. Thank you. There's your second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilman Waring, special meeting December 20th, 2017. I didn't get a chance to review it, Mayor. You want to hold that item Please till the end of the meeting? Want to hold, to just continue. Okay, so we're going to continue that to the next meeting. What date is that? February 21st. Is that okay? There's a motion to continue. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. The city manager has informed me that the problem with that particular TV has to do with a HD conversion. We're trying to convert channel 11 or HD. The meeting is going out citywide. Uh, but Pat, that is a old school TV and we don't have in our budget for a new TV. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. It is, being, it is being filmed. It will be on YouTube. It's just not on that particular television. And you get it even better. You're live and in person. You get to see the meeting right now, here and now. All right, how about boards and commissions? Is there a motion on boards and commissions? Motion to approve mayor's boards and commissions nomination, noting item five, which was continued from January 24th, 2018, has been withdrawn. Is there a second? second. There's a motion and a second on boards and commission. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Looks like we have many talented people here to be sworn in, so I'm going to come to the floor and swear in those individuals who are going to serve on key boards and commissions, and then afterwards you come behind the dais so the individual council members can say thank you for your service. So please raise your right hand, I, and state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that, I will and that I will faithfully and impartially, and impartially discharge, the duties discharge the duties of the office of, of, the office of your mind. according to the best of my ability. So help me God. You're official. Thanks for your service. Please give a round of applause. Great to see you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, liquor license applications. Vice Mayor, do we have an omnibus on liquor license applications? Motion to approve items 6 through 20, except item 13 and 20. Do you have a second? 
Second. We have a motion and a second on liquor license applications. Any cards on those items? All in favor? Aye. 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 I jumped, I missed, I, the cards are all in favor and apparently the council is all in favor as well. I assume that's an okay uh, motion. All right, so the motion was in favor and the ayes were in favor. Any opposed? The liquor license pass unanimously. Item 13, Councilman DeCicio. There's a motion to approve 13. This is provision coffee bar. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. There's a few cards on those items. Miss Lavona. Buttram, did you want to provide testimony on item 13, a proposed liquor license recommendation on Provision Coffee Bar, followed by Mora Cordova, both opposed to the item. And then we have one person not wishing to speak in favor, Mr. Daniel Suh. Ms. Buttram? It's actually Lavana. I'm Lavana Buttram. I live in the neighborhood. We, um, we fought to have this particular uh, establish, establishment going in the very beginning because I've been there for 25 years and it's been very disruptive ever since they've started. Um, I assume some of you have young children and pets. We don't have a street that goes through. It actually kind of comes to, uh, goes around in a circle. There's also a, um, a, what is it, a grade school, I guess, that's just up the street from the house, which is on Campbell. So the, the corner of 32nd Street and Campbell is, of course, where this is going. Um, when folks aren't going to be able to go up Campbell, heading east, what they do is they come down and they try to go down our street, which is Meadowbrook. It's not a through street. What happens is, is they realize once they're on the street, it's not a through street. So they speed up because they're upset and they start buzzing around the corner. We've got children, we've got pets, we've got issues. Now we're gonna have people that are drinking and of course I understand that it's against the law to drink and drive, but it happens every day though. Um, the traffic in the neighborhood, it's a small neighborhood, uh, is going to increase. That's a very big concern of ours. The school's a very big concern of ours. Um, in addition to that, where the liquor, where they're asking for this liquor license, it's actually going to be on a patio. And again, we were told this would never happen, facing our backyards. So there's gonna be music, noise, until midnight or two o'clock in the morning facing my bedroom. Thanks, Al. So um, they put up the sign to inform us about this over the holidays. Many of us were out of town. I thought that was quite interesting. So we would have, you would have actually had more letters against this had it been put up during a time that we would have all had a chance to see it. I don't believe that we're necessarily against a liquor license, maybe just a different liquor license. Postinos and LGO managed to make a great living with a uh, liquor, or I'm sorry, a beer and wine license just up the street. So, I, I mean, that would probably be something, it was something initially we were told that would go in there. We were told there would never be a liquor license. From the very beginning, we were told that. Obviously, that's now changed. So I think that we would maybe be more open to a more limited license, okay? Thank you, um, we, 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 each person has two minutes, so if you I'm up. sorry, have I passed that? You did pass it up, but you went a little longer. I want just a but... little bit more. You know, the other concern is that, again, our back walls face this. Ever since the construction has started, there has been loitering, the dogs are barking, there's all kinds of stuff going on back there. Once that gets in there and you've got people drinking, it, it's just gonna get worse. People can throw things over into our yards. It's just a huge concern for those of us that have children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mayor. Ms. Cordo uh, Cordova. Hi, thank you. I'm here to formally protest the liquor license application oh, pro for Provision Coffee Bar. This is part of a commercial development happening in our neighborhood at a corner that had previously housed medical offices and some other small offices. While I support the developer's need to profit and the business owner to owners need to build a strong business, I question the need for the liquor license at a shop that will be known for its coffee. A group of us neighbors met with the owner and he seems like a solid stand-up individual who was interested in addressing our concerns. He said they are community-minded and want to be good neighbors and wants to be transparent and we appreciate that. But I want to note that this is a few blocks from an elementary school and about a quarter mile from Camelback High School. 
The business plans to serve alcohol until midnight on Friday and Saturday nights and 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday. I also understand from the developer that another establishment coming in to this lot, a sandwich shop, plans to ask for a liquor license. There's also a market and a bakery coming in and they may also ask for liquor licenses for all we know. And who knows, there may be other applications. As you know, this process with developers is never as transparent as it should be. We don't need more liquor licenses in our neighborhood as there are plenty of restaurants and bars nearby already serving alcohol. Is there a limit to how many new liquor licenses you can put in a neighborhood right next to each other? And can you limit the hours of serving alcohol to help us address safety concerns that we have for our homes and families? We're a safe neighborhood that cares about our homes. Please don't approve these applications without considering the long-term repercussions on your constituents and at least postpone for now so that we have time to meet with some of the city's liquor license staff to understand the long-term ramifications that we're seeking information for. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. The only other card is Daniel Suh, who I believe is the applicant. Did you provide any testimony before this, uh, before this council on this uh, item? Please come forward. Can I ask a question? Maybe Please, Councilman Stark had a question, I apologize. Uh, so they were talking about the outdoor patio. That usually requires a use permit that close to the neighborhood. It appears they haven't filed for that yet. In, in the staff report, it sounds like it hasn't been filed or has it been filed and not heard? Mayor, members of the council, my name is Denise Archibald with the City Clerk Department. Councilwoman Stark, at the time that the report was written, the applicant had not yet submitted an application for zoning. Since the applicant is here, um, we, I'm not sure if they actually have applied since then. Yeah, if I can clarify, we, we do have a concurrent application with the Zoning and Planning Department. Uh, we have a hearing scheduled later this month to discuss. So can I just, in, in doing that, you can limit the hours of operation, right? So. Um, that's something I think the neighborhood needs to be involved if this does move further because you may want 10 o'clock but it may end up being 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock so there is a process to talk about some of the noise and, and other concerns the neighborhood may have. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Saad, did you have any additional testimony and then we'll turn to the council. Yeah, um, I just wanted, I, I did submit a letter just giving some context to the, the councilman uh, about our business and whatnot. Uh, we are primarily a cof local coffee roaster and our primary business is coffee. We did apply for specifically a restaurant liquor license, which is restrictive on, on the, the sales of alcohol that we can, can sell. Uh, we do have in our location that does have a beer and wine license, but that uh, represents less than 15% of our sales in that particular location. Uh, it, we view the, the sale of liquor as more of an ancillary business. Uh, we are in open dialogue between the neighbors, as um, Mara has, just, has spoken about, as we met last Tuesday to try to, uh, to address those concerns. We continue to be uh, in support of having the ongoing dialogue. Um, we're more than willing to adhere to whatever standards and policies that the zoning board might have. But uh, at the end of the day, we, our interests are aligned. We do want to be good neighbors. It's just that uh, we believe that we'd like to sell alcohol in, in a, a junction, or excuse me, uh, with coffee, uh, especially at night when most people are coming for coffee and not everyone wants a coffee drink. But uh, we do believe it's a minor part of our business in that sense. All right, thank you very much. Why, why Series 7 and Gilbert, Series 12 in Phoenix? Right. Uh, we elected a Series 7 just because we weren't sure in that particular neighborhood. It's more of a strip mall. Uh, we weren't sure what percentage of the business, because that was our first location. But when, after that was done, we, we could see that it was, uh, it was really obvious that we, uh, you know, liquor isn't a big part of our business. It's really a minor part. So we just elected for a restaurant license since it is um, more restrictive, but not as onerous as uh, the cost and associated with a beer and wine license. Okay, I'm confused by that. Uh, so maybe Denise, you can help us educate okay. us. Uh, Series, you know, obviously have Series Seven and Gilbert, which the neighbors seemed like they were mm -hmm. more okay with than uh, Series Twelve. What's the what will be the significant differences that are relevant for us to consider? Yes, Mayor, members of the council. So the Series Seven is a bar license. It basically allows for an unlimited amount of sales of alcohol, but specifically and restricted to only beer and wine. And so that's how that one is limited. In terms of a restaurant license, it is a license that requires 40% food sales, and so it's restricted that way, but of any alcohol. Okay, Vice Mayor, do you have a comment or question? Mayor? Oh, oh. 
comes from Yeah, there, there is concern about the hard alcohol part of it, but it's a trade-off, though, too, is that you want them to be able to sell food, otherwise then it becomes a real bar. And if the neighborhood's just looking for a beer and wine, I mean, that's really more to your advantage than it is because then he can literally sell unlimited amounts of alcohol. Uh, right now he's restricted because it treats it as a restaurant, and that's how we've done other projects like that throughout the city of Phoenix. Um, would you mind a two-week continuance? I think that they need to sit down with staff and go through each of these options. I mean, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, it, well, it sounds like he is talking to the community, but at the end of the day, um, they need to understand what mm -hmm. the impacts are going to be, and maybe we just do a two-week continuance on this, Mayor. There's okay, so uh, Councilman uh, has asked for a two-week continuance. Yeah. Is there a second on that? Second. There's there a second on that. on this that we need? Please. Mayor, members of the council, as long as the applicant is amenable to the continuance, we'll have him sign the paperwork required right now. Are you okay with a two-week continuance? Sounds like you have a little, little more work to do with the neighborhood to uh, convince them of the wisdom of your request. Uh, sure, yeah. If they need more time, I'm more than open to signing that. I'm very amenable to that. Thank you very much. And, and in that two-week period, I, I know we're not really supposed to, but I'd like to do it this way. I'd like to have language in there, at least a discussion or an agreement somewhere in there with the neighborhood on where the outdoor dining is going to be. I was unaware of that part of it. I thought it was just going to be the inside of it. Um, but, I, you know, that would concern me too, especially if you've got music that is going to be going right into someone's backyard. So I think that that is a very legitimate request. And if you could address that too, and we can also look at hours of when that might be. So that way, when you go to the um, outdoor dining part of this, I don't see why it would turn down a and a license here, I'm just letting people know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am concerned about the fact that, that the hard liquor part of it, but I understand why. Mm -hmm. I just need to make sure the, under, the neighbors understand that. And that's stuff that you can actually agree to when you go into with your zoning um, hearing officer. You can say, hey, these, these are the things we're going to be doing. You'll be restricted to that. The other part of it, too, is your timing of when you're going to be able to play music or not play music or have people outside. So those are things that I think that should be discussed. We do this throughout the city of Phoenix. It's not a complicated case. It, it's complicated when it's one person, one neighborhood dealing with it, but this is stuff that has to be re resolved throughout because you know Phoenix is a tight area anymore and this is what's mm -hmm. been happening. So if we could do that, just make a motion to approve for two, a uh, motion to continue for two weeks, Mayor. All right, we have a motion. We had a second. Any other comments from the council on a continuance? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much uh, for coming down, everyone. Next item on the agenda is item 20. Item 20 is a liquor license proposal uh, in District 8, Bernice Love Amvets, Post 86. Councilman Gallego, how would you like to proceed? Can we have a brief presentation from our staff? Mayor and members of the council, this request is for a new Series 14 private club license for Bernice Love Amvitz Post 86. This location was previously licensed for liquor sales and may currently operate with an interim permit. Staff recommends disapproval of this application based on a police department recommendation for disapproval. Wonderful, and it looks like we have uh, one card in support and one card against, so if we could um, take testimony, maybe starting with our, our, our officer. Um, Jared Smart, and then the uh, person supporting the license. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. My name is Detective Jared Smart. I work out of the South Mountain Precinct, and I'm the de t uh, liquor liaison detective. A little history on Post 5, which is the prior post in the last 18 months uh, before losing their AMVETS charter. They had 15 calls for service. Uh, five fights, two shootings, and an aggravated assault. Our investigation on this application is, has revealed the applicants are not reliable, capable, or qualified. The post commander, which is the primary applicant, Mr. Leon Brookins, has several bo uh, bankruptcies and liens against him. And we made several attempts to interview and have a conversation with Mr. Brookins, and he failed to return my phone calls. Uh, the Co-applicant, Mr. Washington, who's the sergeant in arms at the AMVETS, um, told us in an interview, actually met with us, that Mr. Brookins was elected the commander because he would, have, he would have nothing to do with the club and did not want to uh, participate. 
So on December the 28th, we met with Mr. Washington at our office. Um, they had had a previous application that we had discussed with them that they'd withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Washington said he'd only been to the club a couple times since their withdrawal and did not know what was going on with the club. Um, in that first application, we had located a hidden owner. When asked um, about that hidden owner, Mr. Washington could not provide us any information. Um, he did tell us that they had a meeting with the owner or the hidden owner, who we believe was the hidden owner, and his wife about the financials and asked them where the money was to come to was uh, coming in to run the club, and he was unable to answer that question. He then explained to us the startup of the club was uh, he knows our hidden owner's wife very well, and they were at his mother-in-law's house when our hidden owner approached Mr. Washington and Mr. Brookins and asked them to participate in the AMVETS to uh, provide their DD-214, their um, discharge paperwork, and they agreed as long as they didn't have to pay their dues. Um, during the investigation, I was able to locate several social media posts um, showing improvements to the club, and Mr. Washington was unable to provide me who actually provided the money for those improvements or who did the improvements. Um, in those social media posts, we found gang activity and our hidden owner um, soliciting for their Title IV training and employees and then advertising a memorial for a fellow gang member. On that previous meeting, on, on uh, was November the 9th, and we met with uh, a council woman Gallego staff. Uh, Mr. Washington was present and agreed to uh, withdraw the application due to our hidden ownership. They agreed to restructure the club and that their hidden owner would not be involved at all. On that prior uh, application, um, myself and my sergeant did an inspection for their interim permit, and uh, Mr. Kerry Love was the one that said he was the manager of the club, and he was found to be our uh, hidden owner. In an interview with Mr. Briggs, who was the prior applicant post commander, um, he could not answer any financial questions. Mr. Love was present and answered all the financial questions, and during that provided us that he was financing the club through his personal bank account. Um, it was also found that Mr. Love is a convicted felon. Mr. Love is also a documented member of the Hoover Crip Gang, and their colors are orange and blue. In videos on social media, you, we've seen uh, Mr. Love hanging out in front of the club, throwing up gang signs, wearing gang indicia, and the inside of the club was painted orange. There's also videos posted on social media of Mr. Love Crip walking in the club and behind the bar with his wife, who's a bartender. Mr. Washington was unable to provide us any kind of financial documents for it. Um, and I also contacted the AMVETS National Organization who has started an internal investigation into their charter. Based on this, I believe that the applicants are not capable, reliable, or qualified. And I think that it would not be a good idea for the community to approve this liquor license. Thank you. I think you're Officer Smart for your um, thorough testimony. Mr. Brookings, did you provide testimony for this council? You're in favor of the proposed liquor license uh, at uh, Bernice Love AMVETS Post 86. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Leon Brookings. I am the commander of AMVETS Post 86. And I would like to state for the record, I've never been contacted by anybody from the city of the Phoenix Police Department. And as far as my financial background goes, he says several bankruptcies, which the last one was, sir, 2005. So I have no idea what he is referring to. Uh, as far as gang activity and anything like that, I'm a 23 year veteran of the United States Air Force. I have served my country proudly I am no near associated with any gang affiliates. If they are, they are not a part of the AMVET Post 86. Mr. Love is not a hidden owner. He is nearly nothing more than a volunteer, just like every other citizen in the South Side community of Phoenix. Now, what we are trying to do is provide programs and associate ourselves to show that as African-American men, we can come back from serving our country and contribute to our community. 
without any harassment or discrimination. Now I can understand everyone has a history, but are they not allowed to change their lives, change their directions and try to support their community even though they did at one time might have brought that community down? I'm here, sir, to represent the post. I believe that uh, we have not had even a plastic knife pulled since I've been there. There has not been any police activity since the application. In fact, I'm not even a member of Post 5. I don't even know what Post 5 is. I guess that's the history of the building. But the people involved in Post 86 has nothing to do with Post 5. Post 86 is upstanding, outstanding, and we're doing great work, even with the small amount of donations that are really rough on everyone that's involved because we are just starting up. So our membership isn't up. We answered to a National Association of American Veterans. And we're trying to help the community and these African American males who don't have any representation down at the VA so they can come through us so we can represent them. In the meantime, generate don funds for us to, uh, to reach to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, for that testimony. Thank you for your service to the country. Councilman Gallego, how would you like to proceed after that testimony? Um, when you applied, did you give us a phone number where we could reach you? Yes, ma'am. My, my number is on the application. I wasn't contacted by anyone. My, uh, I have my voicemails all the way back to November. If, I, and when if, I found out that Mr. Washington had a meeting, I asked why was I not contacted? If we were to continue this with two weeks, for two weeks, would you have time in that period to meet with us and answer the questions about Definitely. Work? Wonderful. So you'd be what we it would be a piece of paperwork you'd sign saying that it would be okay to continue Absolutely. it. Absolutely. If, if that um, Denise, does that seem May like a good plan? Mayor, members of the council, Councilwoman Gallegos, yes, we will give him that paperwork right now. Wonderful. Uh, then I would motion that we continue this vote until our February twenty first meeting of the Phoenix City Council. <coughs> Thank second. you. There's a motion. There is a, a second. Any additional comments by members of this council? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, now we're going to move on to ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning. Vice Mayor, do we have an omnibus motion uh, prepared? Motion to approve items 21, 354, except the following. Items 21, 24, 37, and 52 through 54. And that's it. That is our motion. Is there a second on that motion? Second. There is a, a second. Are any cards on those items? Any comments by members of our council? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Mayor Stanton? Yes. Next item on our agenda <coughs> is item 21. <coughs> is there a motion on item 21? Move approval of item 21. Second. There is a motion and a uh, second. Any cards on 21? Any comments by members of this council? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Stark? Yes. Valenzuela? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Mayor Stanton? Yes. That item passes 8 to 1. Item 24 is next. Move approval of item 24. Second. Motion and a second. Any cards on 24? Any comments by members of this council? Councilwoman yep. Gallego, please. Thank you. Um, item 24 is for the police department to purchase sexual assault testing kits. Um, this is a very important initiative. We've had a, a backlog of kits and have made a commitment at the city to test all of the kits and going forward and talking regularly with the police department about the importance of this and of clearing that backlog and um, pleased to see this one moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any additional comments? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. That item passes unanimously. Next item is item 37. Is there a motion on 37? Uh, move approval of item 37. Second. There's a motion and a second. Councilman Guy, go ahead. Comments on 37. Um, item 37 is the uh, police department's effort to uh, do public outreach and in invest in recruiting efforts. 
I think growing our police department is something that the council is unanimously very excited about. And just as we move forward in this, I would love it if the police department prioritizes reaching out to people who have an interest in technology and uh, crime investigation uh, using technology because I think that's an important part of our policing work and one that will be ever growing as the city grows and as we move forward. Thank you. Any additional comments by members of the council? Councilman Valenzuela, please. Uh, no, I'm fully supportive, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I had comments. I Any additional comments? Do you need a second? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to vote. I'm fully supportive. All right, good. Roll call. My apologies. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes unanimously. Item, we're now on our planning and zoning agenda. Next item on the agenda is item number 52, a proposed zoning case at the southwest corner of 43rd Avenue and Baseline. For this matter, we'll hear a short staff report on the uh, uh, zoning proposal. Then I'll hold a public hearing and take any public testimony that uh, folks may want to provide. Close that public hearing. And I'll turn it to uh, the council to see if there's a motion, a second, and then we'll take our vote. So first, Mr. Stevenson, our planning director, uh, could you give a short staff report on this item? Thank you, Mayor, members of council. This request is a planning hearing officer modification for stipulations of a rezoning case that's approximately 995 feet west of the southwest corner of 43rd Avenue and Baseline Road. The applicant is requesting to modify four stipulations of the previously approved rezoning case. Uh, this case was withdrawn from the agenda and advertised for a public hearing uh, today from a prior council agenda so that the applicant could sit down and meet with village planning committee members, staff, uh, as well as neighbors to try and address some of the issues. Uh, today we have had that meeting. Here's the subject site as you see it right around here in black with a residential all around it where there's existing farm fields. This is the zoning for it. It's approved R18 zoning, similar zoning all around in this whole area for it. This is their proposed uh, site plan that shows the larger lots to the south, a little bit smaller lots to the north as you go up closer to Baseline Road and some planned commercial improvements in the future at the immediate corner and then also the school site, uh, which is shown right here in this area here. Uh, with that, uh, staff does recommend approval of the memo that came out uh, dated uh, February I'm sorry, dated January, uh, let's see, January 30th. Uh, and with that, we are happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Stevenson? Okay, I'm now going to open up the public hearing on item number 52. Public hearing is now uh, open. There are a few cards uh, on this item. I don't know if there's a particular order. They all appear to be in favor. Three people wishing to speak or at least in favor, and they can choose whether to speak. Mr. Reed Butler, Mr. Ruskin Lines, and Mr. Robert Branscom. Mr. Butler, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Thank you, Mayor. Reed Butler, Butler Housing Company, 42 West Mariposa Street. Also here, Dr. Rusty Lines and uh, West Lines. He's the fellow with the nice shiner in the back, just in case you hadn't noticed that. Um, uh, and I think Rusty will probably not uh, speak, Mayor. Is that okay? Of course. Rusty. Uh, so we uh, took some time from the last meeting, sat down with the Village Planning Committee and other leaders, worked through the stipulations that uh, Mr. Stevenson has presented, and we are in full agreement with the stipulations. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Butler? Mr. Branscombe, did you wish to provide testimony on item 52? Is he still here? Okay, so he submitted a card in favor of the item. Is anyone else here wishing to provide testimony on item number 52? Going once, going twice, public hearing is now closed. Councilman Gallego, did you have a motion you'd like to make on item 52? I do, and I would like to thank both the Village Planning Commission members and the applicants for working together. Um, very productive dialogue, and the community is very excited about the project. So with that, I move approval per the memo from the Planning and Development Director dated January 30th, 2018, with a modification to stipulation number 33 to require the developer to provide a minimum of two rows of three-inch caliper trees planted 20 feet on the center or in equivalent groupings in the open space area adjacent to Baseline Road to provide screening of the residents from the street as approved by the Planning and Development Department. I'll second that, Mayor. Motion and a second. Any comments or questions by members of this council? Mayor, the negotiations Please. look pretty tough. You look at West. <laughs> <laughs> I 
All right. Um, any other comments by members of the council? <laughs> All right. We try to keep our negotiations peaceful, nonviolent in the city of Phoenix. All right. So there's a motion. There's a second. No other additional comments. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Norkowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Astor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes unanimously for the City Council. Next item on the agenda is item 53, and it appears that 53 and 54 are related uh, items. So we'll have a staff report on both 53 and 54. We'll hold a public hearing on both 53 and 54, and I, and I think we have to do separate motions, uh, though. So, Mr. Stevenson, would you please uh, provide your uh, report on 53 and 54, 7th Avenue and Turney R Avenue, southeast corner? Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. I ask stated these two items are for the same property. Item 53 is a request to rezone that one acre site from C2, 7th Avenue overlay to C2 height waiver, 7th Avenue overlay. And item 54 is a request to add a special permit to that to allow for self storage and all underlying C2 uses to be developed on that property. Uh, the proposed use uh, would be for a self storage facility and a building height up to 56 feet. Staff does recommend approval per stipulations for both of these items. You see the subject site here, which is just off 7th Avenue right here. This uh, piece of dirt right here is now a four and five story apartment project that is, will be opening any day now um, and is, is completely built out. Uh, you see the zoning for this site right here exists C2. This gray area shows the 7th Avenue overlay area, which is really an overlay to give character to 7th Avenue and help the merchants along that whole area. Because the site already had commercial zoning, that's why it was included within this particular overlay when it was done a number of years ago. Alan, I'm, I want to ask a question before. Vice Mayor, please. Where it's marked? It was not part of the overlay because it was already C2. Did I hear you correctly? No, it was part of the overlay because it already did have commercial zoning okay. on it. So right. this is the subject site with a black crosshatch. This gray color is what signifies the 7th Avenue Main Street Overlay District, which is what unifies all of 7th Avenue in that area from the, the Commercial Merchants Association. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jameson, please. This is their proposed site plan where you see the, the four-story building here. Here's parking on this side over here. This is uh, 7th Avenue as you come around the curve right over here. This is what the proposed renderings of the project uh, look like so that it does have a higher design standard because of where it is along 7th Avenue. You see they incorporated some of the elements of the, the Melrose Arch there to help blend in with the, the character and what people are really working hard to create along that 7th Avenue merchant uh, overlay there. With that, staff is happy to answer any questions. It was approved by the uh, Village Planning Committee by an 8-0 to zero vote, uh, as well as the Planning Commission. Are there very much any questions at this time for Mr. Stevenson? All right, we'll move on to the public hearings, and I'm going to open a public hearing on both 53 and 54. So if you are here on either of those items, now is the time to provide your testimony. Public hearing is now uh, open. I'll start with Mr. Uh, Charles Jones. While you're getting ready, could I make a suggestion? Uh, no, we're not going to, we're going to do that, but we'll get to, I know you still have citizen comments. So we'll get to you in just a moment, Mr. Vent. We're get, we are hearing item number 53 and 54 at this time. Mr. Jones, please. Good afternoon, Mayor Stanton, Vice Mayor Pastor, members of the council. My name is Charlie Jones. I'm president of the Community Alliance of 7th Avenue, president of Pearson Place Historic District, and chairman of Alhambra Village Planning Committee. Today, I'll be speaking on behalf of Community Alliance of 7th Avenue, and I'll make some comments from Pearson Place Historic District. Um, Community Alliance of 7th Avenue works in 7th Avenue, uh, the Melrose District, from Camelback to Indian School on that one mile path. We do improvement projects to improve the identity of the Melrose District. I won't bore you with all the projects we do. We're a grassroots community organization, organization of volunteers that come from the four surrounding historic neighborhoods, Pearson Place, Grandview, Woodley, and Carnation. Uh, one of our biggest projects is we're building a community park right across the street from the subject prop, uh, prop project. Excuse me. 
All of our members have gone to all the outreach meetings for the project. We have all looked at it very intently, and we support it fully. We think it's a good use for that site. It is off 7th Avenue. It's quiet. There's no traffic, dust, fumes, light pollution. And that it's compatible, actually, with the single family residential that's adjacent to it because of those reasons. We also think the 24-hour security that's provided in this project is a plus for this area. So with that, I just uh, reaffirm we support this completely. From the Pearson Place side, uh, none of our board members oppose this project. I won't bore you with the long story, but the short story is we had some problems approve, uh, supporting a project in the past and have since chosen not to support projects in writing at this time. My board is a little bit hesitant to do that, so the best I can offer you today from Pearson Place is that nobody opposes it. I have asked them and nobody opposes it. So with that, I would just like to reiterate, we urge you to approve this, both of these items. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Mr. Jones. Mr. Uh, Gardner, you should provide testimony on this item. Please come forward. You're opposed to uh, 53 and 54? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Will Gardner. I live at 311 West Roma, which is just a couple hundred feet uh, uh, east and one block uh, north of this proposed facility. <clears throat> I've been there for about eight years. and. Uh, I moved from Levine, I had a two acre lot out there, and I looked at no less than 73 homes before I found this home, because it was absolutely perfect in a perfect neighborhood, so we thought. <clears throat> and the reason why we moved there is because it had character and charm. The reason why we moved from Levine is because it didn't, it had a whole bunch of these storage units going up everywhere and big box places, so that's why we moved. <clears throat> and I feel that this project is a move towards losing that charm and the character of our, of our little neighborhood there. And <clears throat> by the way, there was a, they said that this was approved unanimous, unanimously. There were, I think, two votes against it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, so here, here are my main concerns for this place. There's already a ton of storage units within a half a mile, like three or four, I think. <clears throat> and then I also believe that this doesn't bring any vitality to our community or jobs, maybe one, maybe two. <clears throat> it only brings dollars to the owners that definitely don't live in our community. I also believe that, <clears throat> that this, this unit in our neighborhood is going to be a place for these crackheads running around robbing our houses and then storing it there. So it's convenient for them, not for us. <clears throat> also, uh, another thing is the Melrose District has character, like I said before, and I, I really believe that this is losing that character. And I don't want the Melrose District to be known as the storage district. I mean, like I said, we searched forever for this house. And then again, it is also way too tall for our neighborhood. It's a historic district right across the street. And as you'll hear from some of my neighbors over here, none of us in the direct neighborhood that this is in approve of this. None of us do. <clears throat> and also, my last concern is safety. Um, I feel that this is, you know, I know mean, they say that these storage units don't bring a lot of traffic, but they still bring traffic. And, you know, you guys want the city to be more walkable. There's going to be more, more cars on Turney Avenue, and there are no sidewalks in our neighborhood. There's going to be more traffic, no sidewalks. That's going to lead to some kind of safety, especially with me. I have two children, two small children. <clears throat> so. Something that I, I want you guys to ask yourselves before voting on this is, does it fit into the general plan of the city, which I don't believe that it does? Does it make the Melrose District more walkable? Absolutely not. And does this project truly fit into the neighborhood? Being that I live in there, I say no. But these are questions that I want you guys to ask yourselves before voting on this, please. And the last one, does this project add any jobs or vitality to our small little community known as the Melrose District? And I also feel that the city of Phoenix is losing touch with 
some of our historic districts, ours especially. <clears throat> and, and also, I feel that, uh, you know, they, they don't really, you guys don't really seem to care about our neighborhood or the people that live in them. So please, prove me wrong. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garner, for your uh, uh, testimony. Uh, Ms. Stevenson, it's important that we get accurate information uh, before this council. You indicated earlier that there was a unanimous vote of the Village Planning Committee and Planning Commission. Mr. Gardner indicated that that was not accurate. I don't know if you had a chance to review. We just want to make sure that we have uh, accurate information before this council. Mayor, members of the council, I apologize. The Planning Commission was 8-0 to zero vote. The uh, Village Planning Committee was a 12-2 to two vote. Okay. Uh, thank you much for uh, clarifying that for ourselves and for the uh, public. Also, Mr. Gardner indicated that uh, this was not consistent with the general plan of the city. I don't know if he was using general plan as a term of art or more uh, generically about the, the look and feel of the city. In terms of its uh, compliance with general plan, maybe you can address that. Sure, Mayor, members of council. Uh, staff does believe that this request is uh, consistent with the general plan and helps implement the character of the 7th Avenue Main Street uh, overlay, as well as our plans uh, for the um, uptown TOD district, which covers this area. It is uh, more intense use in terms of the uh, building height. It is, uh, as I said, just directly to the south is a four and five story apartment project. Uh, directly to the uh, east of that is also three story uh, condo and apartment project. So there is height within this area in addition to the design that they're proposing uh, is something that is a much greater standard uh, for a self-storage facility than you would typically see. They are doing that because of input with the community uh, that they worked on to make that design fit in in a better fashion. It does uh, implement several goals of the general plan as well related to uh, connecting people and places, uh, reusing this existing site, and celebrating diverse things within our neighborhoods and communities because it does have that additional art component to it that is a direct result of working with the community and the, the merchants in that area. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Palowski? Pam Palowski. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Pam Palowski. I live in Melrose District 4. I'm currently the president of the Grandview Neighborhood Association and secretary of the Community Alliance of 7th Avenue. I'm the past president of the Woodley Melrose Neighborhood Association and a member of the 7th Avenue Merchants Association. I want to talk for a minute about the developers today and my experience with them. In my experience, I've worked with many developers along the way, and I would say that the Raskins started out by following the prescribed process and met with much resistance. After two meetings, I was approached by an unsung hero in this process, who I'm not sure is here today, but that is Tom Bilston. And Tom is a community outreach expert. After discussion with him, he approached the Raskins. And what happened then was they listened, they delayed, they regrouped, and they engaged our community in a way that resulted in, uh, in what should be a model for all developers. I commend their extraordinary steps, and especially that they were all self-imposed. The Melrose District is loud and proud. The Raskins and Withy Morris were willing to listen. They have shown commitment to being good partners in the Melrose area. For these reasons, I am in favor. Thank you very much uh, for that testimony. And yes, Tom is here to hear those kind words. All right. How about uh, Stacy Lewis? You're neutral on the item. You provide testimony. Good afternoon. I'm Stacy Lewis. I own Stacy's at Melrose. I'm a member of 7th Avenue Merchants Association and I'm a past member of the board of, Stacey, of SAMA. Um, as you see on my card there, I'm neutral and there are several reasons I'm neutral. One is that I've dealt with the Raskins personally over the past year, year and a half, and they've been very above board, very fair to me, and they, uh, as a matter of fact, Bruce and I had a nice conversation this morning. I see this going forward as it affects my business in a good, positive way. I'm still going to remain neutral over one thing. 
that uh, concerns me, and that is that back in, I believe it was in March, when we had the uh, community outreach meeting, there were members of all, all five communities and uh, members of SAMA and Melrose, I'm sorry, SAMA and CASA, and there were no positive comments about this, and this is nothing negative towards the project itself, but I wonder why when all seven factions were against what they were hearing, what changed this, how did it get through, and at the Phoenix Planning Commission's meeting, they were commended on how well they did in communicating with the public. So uh, it's a little bit of a concern, I guess it's a procedural concern, but uh, I'm, I'm neutral, leaning in favor of this. They've been good to me. Sure, I'm gonna lose parking at my private, at my personal business, but with working with them, I feel good about this whole scenario. Thank right, you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lewis, for that important uh, testimony. Uh, Brianna Klink. Um, yes, I'm Brianna Klink, Day Ruiz, and I live at 526 West Roma. I can see the curve from my, from my home office, from my front door now. So everyone's talking about, well, there's a five-story building to the south of this. That's an urban residential thing, and it's brand new, and it was controversial, is still controversial. It is out of scale with the neighborhood. And Melrose is going to, um, uh, fall to a death, death by a thousand cuts, just like Roosevelt is. Right now, um, I don't believe that we are fighting the Raskins or, or with the Morris. They have been um, uh, communicative and, and you know, came to our neighborhood associations. They've been talking with people. I think planning and development has fundamentally sided with development over the needs of our, of our um, our communities. There's zoning rules that are being that aren't met, and and that's okay. Um, and this is totally out of character. I think the incompatible with the neighborhood. Um, inside Melrose, the vast majority of buildings, those zoned C2 and can be 30 feet, are one story. You you were just there at the opening of the Lyceum. It's out of scale. And there's a historic park, uh, historic Yaple Park is right, literally across the street. You know, our boundary is on, t on the north side of Turney. Um, those property values are going to decrease as a result. My property value, because instead of seeing palm trees, I'm now going to be looking at a storage facility and I'm one block up. Um, so I would just encourage planning, thank you. That yeah. wasn't for you. Someone oh. has joined us via telephone, so for oh. yeah. <laughs> I, um, I would just encourage you to look at the planning and development staff report. There are several things that are inconsistent, not met, not met. This does support, um, it says that it's compatible with the, the surrounding commercial land uses, but it doesn't say anything about the residential directly across the street. Um, even though due north on Turney, those houses are currently single family and they are zoned multifamily, but there's a historic overlay on them. And within Yapple Park, um, there are only three two-story houses. We're on the National Register. So um, I've, you know, if you've ever gone to HP, it's going to be near impossible for those buildings to increase in height because of the historic overlay. So the multifamily zoning is almost trumped by, by HP. Thank you. Thank you much for your testimony. Ms. Rachel Tulio. Hello there. Um, I'm actually an owner of one of those two-story homes. I live at 502 West Turney, so this project is literally at my doorfront. Um, there's been a lot of things that have been talked about today. I'm going to focus on a few key pieces. One thing I did want clarified is the property is not on 7th Avenue. It is actually on Turney, which is a residential road. Um, you know, it was sort of the ghosts of bad and crazy zoning of the past is coming back to haunt us with this project. Specifically, one of the things I want to talk about today are the ingress and egress issues. Right now, this property 
is landlocked from 7th Avenue. The entire plan hinges on them having right-of-way access to 7th Avenue through the parking lot at Stacy's. However, the zoning outlines for special permit really specifically say that there must be either an abut or direct access. So the question that I have is what have the developers done to deed guarantee a lifetime unrestricted access to 7th Avenue? Because there's nothing stopping the landowners who Stacy's rents from, from turning that driveway into a building. And then that would put the entirety of access for this property onto Turney, which is a residential road. And that of course would make it not eligible for special zoning. So this is a very key issue that I have grave concerns about. Secondary to this would be if that has been put in place, if there is a negotiation, again, I've pulled my own research from the recorder and can find nothing deeded regarding um, easements or right of ways being granted between the landowners. Um, I would request that council put a stipulation such as what was done on the project at 16th Street and Flower that is also another storage facility requiring special zoning that has gated access to the residential road so that it is not a general purpose in and out and it can only be used by people who are renting there. Granted, that you know, is going to still not necessarily make traffic perfect on Turney, but it would be a step in the right direction. But again, I just want to reiterate, there are 34 online storage facilities within a five mile radius of my home. There are five facilities currently under zoning consideration, two of which directly infect me. Um, I won't get into that right now, but I will say that there's no emergent need for this facility that it would be necessity, necessitate bending so many of the zoning restrictions and the not mets. This is not a hospital, this is not a school, this is a facility that is frankly unneeded and to bend the rules and to continue to not address these key issues such as ingress is a huge mistake. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Roman Reyes, also opposed to the uh, proposal. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for hearing us out. Uh, I am a resident of the Melrose Place District. Uh, I live on 218 West Roma. I did not buy it because it's close to my name, but I do love the area in which I live. Uh, I just moved in there about two years ago. I love the historic aspect of it. So with that said, so when you drive into the Melrose District from 7th Avenue and Indian School, what do you see? You see the big Melrose sign. Well, it's a beautiful sign and I take very much pride in that sign because I take pride in my neighborhood and where I live. And I also take pride in the fact that it's a lesbian and gay district as well. And so I take pride as well as my, my neighbors take pride in it as um, in the love and the heart of the middle of the city. So when you look at that sign and you look at the area, you see history, you see vintage shops, you see antique shops, you see mom and pop shops. Um, so therefore, when you see that, you see the history, and in that history, it provides the value. And in that value is what I love in my neighborhood. I don't see any value in providing a storage facility there. That's just my opinion. Um, so with that, with some numbers for you, we have, um, so 62% of the Melrose District is uh, zoned for C2. Out of that 62%, 89% of these are one story and 10% are two-story. So that, why do we need a four-story storage facility? I, I, I just don't get that. Um, I believe it's also detrimental because I don't see how like, you can compare the zoning of the UR to the zoning of the C2. Granted, with, um, with the UR, you have people who live there. You have vitality, you have, you have enjoyment, what enjoyment do you have for a commercial location for a storage facility? And I think that Melrose is all about enjoyment and having a good time and enjoying yourself in a safe manner. Um, so basically what I want to say is I just implore you to deny the rezoning, uh, to raise the ceiling from the 30 feet that's already listed for a C2 to the 56 feet uh, for a four-story. 
to go from a two-story to a four-story in a beautiful historical district with a new building I think is uncharacteristic. And I think we're hurting the preservation of our historical values within this wonderful and great city. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, testimony. Mike Poulton. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, council people. Uh, my name's Mike Poulton. I'm the uh, current president of the 7th Avenue Merchants Association. And uh, I did submit a letter on behalf of the organization in support of this project. But I wanted to come here and speak to a few specific aspects of this. I think it's important when considering this project to have a little more context than has been provided on this property and its position within the 7th Avenue community. What we're looking at here is not uh, a question of whether this proposed storage unit should go forward or whether another great project should go forward in its place on that site. Instead, what we have here is a long abandoned commercial property, which used to be a distribution center for a wholesale florist, <coughs> excuse me, uh, used to be a wholesale florist distribution center and has been vacant for years now We've analyzed loads of different possible uses for this property. We've talked to multiple investors. Uh, as you've heard, the Raskins went through extensive efforts to try to come up with the best way of utilizing this property for the community, and this is what came out of it. The fact of the matter is, it's a very challenging spot for a whole variety of reasons, which some of the neighbors have mentioned. There are not good commercial uses for that area. Because of those difficulties, this is really the best opportunity we have to take uh, an eyesore vacant property that's not doing anything at all for either the residential neighbors or for its owners and turn it into something that is at least innocuous and good looking. Storage is one of the lowest impact uses that a commercial property can have. Although the building may be tall and it may take up a fair bit of area on the site, the actual traffic burden uh, is, is essentially zero from this type of a use. And that's one of the primary reasons that we think this is one of the best things to put there. Um, additionally, I want to mention that while historic preservation is incredibly important in the Melrose District, and we work with, with all of the business owners and property owners in the area to help them make the best use of the historic properties that are there, this property is not one of them. This structure does not really have much historic value, and it doesn't contribute as it sits today to the feel of the neighborhood. It doesn't contribute to the historic aura of the Melrose District. What's going in instead is a modern design that has visual elements that are consistent with our neighborhood. And in fact, it includes an homage in the front to the, the Melrose uh, Arch at the bottom of our street. And we appreciate those efforts that they've put in and I think that's really going to do a, a good job of bringing these newer, bigger projects into visual uh, congruence with the older buildings that are being preserved. And we do have a lot of good preservation projects that are underway in Melrose and will be coming before you in the next year or so. And we look, we look forward to being able to mix those preservation activities with these newer development activities and help the street continue to be economically productive and good looking for everyone. Thank, Thank you very you. much uh, for that and testimony. I also have a card from Ms. Ms. Cynthia Lee opposed to the item. The card is for one marking not wishing to speak, but did you wish to provide testimony at this time? It's up to you. I don't have, I'm Cynthia Lee. Um, I don't have that much to say except for I've lived here for five and a half years. I like my neighborhood. But we weren't contacted in the very beginning. Nobody contacted any of the residents of Yaple Park. It was Pearson Place. You sit it yourself. It wasn't Yaple Park. We got in on the tail end after it already was rolling along and they had had the first meeting where the building was. Um, it should stay. If you want to do a storage, go ahead and do a storage, but two stories. Don't add to the height of the district. It's not needed, as Will said and everybody else said, we don't need storage. And I don't, and I live right next to Bree. I'm at 528. I look out my door and I see the curve, and now I'm going to see the storage, and I don't want to see it. 
That's it. Thank you very much uh, for that testimony. I have no other cards. Is anyone else here wishing to provide testimony on items 53 and or 54? Mr. Morris, you have something to add? You're the uh, representative of the applicant? I am. Please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, I'm going to go through this briefly because I think much of what I was going to say has already been covered. I do want to begin by pointing out my office and personally, I've never been associated with an application quite like this. We actually were brought in after the fact. The application had already been filed. There was a neighborhood meeting uh, that initially took place in March of 2017. There was strenuous opposition at that point. It was well attended and there was a very clear direction that this facility was not appreciated, this design was not accepted, and this use was not going to be supported by the neighborhood. Hopefully, uh, Mayor and Council, what you've seen tonight is that we do, in fact, have support from the organizations within that neighborhood. And I regret that there are still members of the community who are opposed to this, but I can honestly say I have never seen a better and more thorough community outreach with any case I've been associated with. To such an extent, we'll go into this briefly, that the design in large part for this building comes from the community itself rather than the local developers, uh, Bruce and Kim Raskin, who are here this afternoon. This is the site that we're discussing, and, and it's important to take the context into account in that this one acre parcel is not directly abutting 7th Avenue, but has direct access to 7th Avenue via an easement in place. So that addresses one of the comments made earlier about uh, having access to 7th Avenue. Although because of the location of this one acre site, it does not have visibility. So it is never going to be a traditional commercial site as you would typically have on the arterial, which is why a self-storage facility makes sense on such a small parcel off of 7th Avenue. It's also worth noting you wouldn't want something that's going to be a high traffic generating traditional retail use inside the neighborhood boundaries. This instead is a more transitional use that is a very low intensity use. But as you can see from this picture, it's also adjacent to what shows here is a construction site, which is now a 60-foot multifamily building to the south and uh, adjacent to existing multifamily that's three, two and three stories uh, to the east. This gives a better design uh, and perspective of where that construction site is immediately adjacent to it and also points out the zoning in place is C2, but it's essentially an abandoned building that has been abandoned for several years without any use and adding nothing to the community. Uh, this is another angle of that. It's a fenced off building. This is what the Raskins bought and were determined to redevelop. The view as you go both north and south on 7th Avenue doesn't permit visibility to this site whatsoever, which is why bringing a use to such a small site in this location has been a challenge over the years and why you have not seen redevelopment. We've already discussed this in terms of other uh, self-storage facilities. In one of the questions that was raised repeatedly, not only in this site, but why the council is seeing self-storage, especially in the city center, is because of the influx of redevelopment within the city center. You know, the neighbors who participated today, even those neighbors who participated in opposition, all agreed on the fact that these neighborhoods are special. And you've also heard that many of these neighbors who spoke today moved here within the last handful of years. And while you're seeing a great influx of people to the city center, the houses themselves haven't gotten bigger. They haven't sprouted garages. They haven't sprouted basements. And as a result, self-storage becomes a component part of this influx of people into historic districts which is why you're seeing this type of uh, use and this type of facility in the neighborhoods. Initially, the, this design was meant to mimic the apartment building that was under construction and approved next door. At the initial neighborhood meeting that I discussed, there was significant pushback to having a building that was seen as another muted stucco building Although the development, the development team really intended to blend into the existing development, there was pushback to this design and pushback to the use. As a result, 
And you know, as, as Pam pointed out, Tom Bilstein and, T and Pam really deserve the credit, Pam in particular, of coming up with a concept, meeting with the ownership, and saying, if this is going to be designed, it has to be designed with neighborhood input. And to that end, something occurred on the site that I, I've never been a part of and would love to be a part of in future zoning cases, and that is a design competition. The developer in this case, uh, as I mentioned, Bruce and Kim Raskin, who are here today, agreed to hire three different architectural firms, hold a neighborhood meeting to get input from the neighborhood that was very well attended to give design clues as to what this building should look like and what is important to Melrose and the other historic related areas as well as the Merchants Association. As a result of that input, two weeks later, all three of the architectural firms came forward with their designs and made a presentation at the Newton. This is a, a shot of that design team. Not only did the design teams have an opportunity to present their designs, but the judges were either the property owners or local community residents, members of the village, or former staff who had design cues in mind based upon what the design competition guidelines were. As a result of that, uh, and this evening, which was covered not only by the local paper, covered by local media, but also traveled throughout all of the social media covering these neighborhoods, which was why we had so much input from these neighborhood groups, uh, resulting in a design that we can get to that hopefully you'll agree is unlike any other type of storage facility you'll see. Not only is the design taking into account the fact that it's on the curve, using materials that are reminiscent of historic development in that area, using sustainable materials, but one of the aspects of this was to create a space within that building that's not storage, that could have a community use, that could be used for art expositions, that could be used for community meetings, that could be used for a purpose other than the storage facility so that there would be a community benefit because that's one of the things that was talked about is there has to be something in this for us as a neighborhood. So the Raskins uh, donated that space in terms of not using it for traditional storage, but instead will program it with the assistance of the community so there can be some community benefit to the building of this structure. Uh, that was also a commitment made very early on in the process. This is some of the other elevations that, again, very unique type of building materials, very atypical, and more importantly, sustainable, because that was one of the guidelines from this design competition. Uh, Mr. Richard Andrews, who's the architect, was the prevailing architect, but even after that design competition, Mr. Andrews met with the other two architectural firms to take some of those design cues and make it part of the ultimate submittal. This whole process took months beyond a typical zoning case, and literally everything was on hold during that process. But during that process, we not only came up with a better design, we came up with community support. So we've already discussed the features. I think the staff report, which is obviously highly supportive of this use, goes through and talks about the design features. In, in terms of height, which was mentioned today, uh, yes, we are requesting a height waiver. This is a 48-foot building, but we are adjacent to a 60-foot building. So in terms of context, this is not out of context. It's actually smaller than the buildings uh, adjacent to us and in the middle of a commercial block on one of the busiest north-south arterials in the city. Uh, I'd also like to address Mr. Lewis's comment, you know, he has been an excellent neighbor, uh, and Stacy's has been an excellent neighbor, and I think there's been a good relationship between the Raskins and Mr. Lewis. In this instance, uh, because the property has been vacant, it has been utilized for, on a month-to-month -month basis for additional parking for Stacy's. It's my understanding that the parties have agreed to continue that. It may not be the amount of parking that's been there historically, because there's no way to develop a one-acre parcel and have essentially that many vacant spaces, but that agreement uh, is meant to continue, and that working relationship is meant to continue. 
Uh, the other thing I'll point out, because this was raised, was the, the signage, and uh, we have already talked about staying within the bounds of the City of Phoenix zoning ordinance and not requesting a variance for the signage purposes, but also looking at signage that's directed to 7th Avenue and to the extent possible, making sure no signage is directed toward uh, any neighborhood in terms of illumination. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and I appreciate the, the time and effort that you've put into this. Councilman Stark, do you have a question? Yes, I do. So could you, uh, could we get the site plan back up and talk a little bit about the access? I'm trying, thank you. Certainly. And um, so you are still gonna come off a attorney, right? I, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Stark, actually there is access from both. There is an existing easement directly uh, from the parcel immediately adjacent to us to the west that gives us access directly to 7th Avenue. Uh, that exists today and it's is existed historically, but there is also access from Turney. So you would have access through the parking lot? I'm, ha I'm yes. sorry. I yes. I'm sure I need new glasses. That may be the problem. The other question was, I think someone from the neighborhood talked about gating. I I'm sorry. Was that Rachel? Yeah. yeah. Could you speak to that issue? Certainly. I think the question was, could we add a stipulation that the access from Turney would be gated access? One of the things that's not unique to this storage facility, but unique at least to the storage facilities you've seen in the last year or so, which is a more modern version, is these are internally accessed units and internally accessed buildings rather than having uh, roll-up doors and access after hours. So access to the building is by code after hours and there isn't 24-hour access to these buildings. They have traditional office hours. Uh, I don't believe there's a significant throat on Turney that would allow the turnaround access that you would have to gate it off of Turney, but there will be limited access. I don't know if it will be at Turney or if it will be further into the parking lot, but the idea is after hours, this will be a secure facility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions? Vice Mayor, please. Ellen, yesterday I met with Brianna Kink and she discussed um, the egress. Can you speak into the mic so we can hear? I'll we think have of microphones for that reason. Mr. Vent? I'm asking you to be respectful. You and you're, 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 I always behave. Vice Mayor has the floor, you please. You're not um, speaking to us, please. We I'm, have a microphone. I have it right here. Can you hear me, reason. Mr. Vent? Can you I'm, hear me? Can you hear me? I can't even hear you now. Speak can up. Can you hear me? Yes, I Thank can you. Now. Thank That's you, Mr. Vent. Alan, the question is egress and ingress. Um, could you please discuss that? Because I met with uh, Brianna Klink yesterday, and she was stating that the egress and ingress uh, was not in line with our uh, general plan. So, Mayor, uh, Councilman Pastor, uh, Vice Mayor Pastor, in this particular instance, um, you see on the aerial overhead here, uh, I'm going to grab the clicker so I can point to you. While I can. Okay. So there are two access points. This shows you the, the easement that goes over to 7th uh, Avenue. And so this is a historical easement that's been there as part of this commercial zoning. This site does have existing C2 zoning. So we're not adding C2 commercial uses and things into this area. It already exists C2. It has this access easement here. It also has access to Turney right here. And uh, as part of this, the zoning ordinance for a self-storage facility such as this does require access from a, uh, from a main arterial street. Other particular C2 uses don't require that. So let's say they wanted to do something more intense like a retail uh, use that would have more traffic in and out, those types of things. They're not required to have this. This is a unique element that is required of the, the mini storage uh, use. And as such, they do have that. They will meet the requirements 
of the zoning ordinance uh, and the general plan, which calls for these areas, when you have a small infill parcel like this, to try and develop something that uh, fits into the character and what's there. And via their design proposal and trying to incorporate uh, the elements of the 7th Avenue Merchants Association uh, designs and what's happening there, as well as the height that surrounds this area, it's completely uh, you know, within the general plan parameters. Okay. The other question is, uh, Michelle, I'm, I'm glad you're here because the question is for you. Um, this neighborhood, uh, Yaple Park, is in the National Historic Registry. And uh, Ellen, if you could go to the design. Um, this design is going to be incorporated into, uh, uh, possibly will be incorporated into the neighborhood. The question that I have for you is, would this devalue the property or the historic neighborhood at any way? Um, we've had other cases like this within our historic um, neighborhoods. And so I'm just, uh, I want it on the record uh, to discuss um, what happens when a new building that is not part of the historic neighborhood, uh, how does that, I guess, affect uh, our historic neighborhoods? Uh, Vice Mayor, Mayor Council, um, I'm not real familiar with the project. I know it's just outside the district. Um, and so um, we have many uh, historic neighborhoods that have multiple story buildings just adjacent to the district. You can think Central Avenue, <laughs> for example, you have many taller buildings than that that are adjacent to the neighborhood. And so, um, you know, it's a situation that exists. It does not affect the integrity of the historic district. Uh, does it have any kind of impact? Um, you know, so that uh, Yaple's not going to lose its designation because this building is built. Um, you'd have to spend a little more time looking at it uh, to, uh, you know, uh, just looking at it. Um, it. It certainly is larger than what you see in the uh, adjacent historic district, but um, I, I don't know if you're thinking like a federal compliance review. Right, right, uh, right. I don't know that, that there are federal funds involved in this project, but um, we'd have to, it's hard to say in just, just a minute or two. <laughs> right, right, and, and, and you're unfamiliar with the project, but I'm just saying there are other historic neighborhoods that have blended with, uh, I guess, modern buildings or newer buildings and have, uh, I don't, uh, the fact that, uh, that it would devalue the property um, in a historic neighborhood. The, 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 the statement was that uh, a building like this would devalue the property in a historic neighborhood. Oh, well, the historic district will still be a historic district. Okay, thank you. Um, other one. It was one with the It had to do with the egress ingress, uh, the fence. The uh, one of the neighbors had comment about putting a fence, I believe, on Turney. I think that that was the comment. And I think um, Councilwoman Stark was uh, speaking about that. So, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, I believe the the applicant is. Uh, try to address that they will have uh, access controlled after hours, so there will be gated access, uh, and okay. uh, it's probably only a card control access point. I think Mr. Morris can explain exactly how their proposal is for that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Morris, is there a gate in the application? Tell us about that, please. Mayor, council member, in this instance, it, it you would essentially be gating a parking lot. Every other building in the area has a parking lot. My, my comment was this is internally accessed and even the storage, even the loading, all of that is internally accessed. So after hours, 
it's a building. It's a secure building. There will be no access to it. And over, even during the access hours, it is a secured building with only card access. But if you created a gate there, one of the things that we talked about earlier was the fact that there's an adjacent property owner that was actually hoping to use that parking lot. And so there would be a gate on one side, but there'd be access on the other if Stacy's was still going to use that parking lot after hours. So there's no reason to gate the parking lot because it's just like every other parking lot to every other building in the area. There's no, there's no nuisance in the parking lot there's, and there's no access to the building. Thank you. Any other questions for, now we're still in public hearing portion of it. So I'll now ask the question right. to members, that's okay. No, of course, it's perfectly fine to have that dialogue during this time as well. Any additional, any other members of the public wish to provide testimony for this council? Ma'am, if you have something to add, please come forward. Anything you want to add uh, as, as reasonably quickly as uh, uh, possible? Um, I, I did just want to please. address, since we did spend a lot of time talking about the tourney access, um, that is actually is a nuisance currently because of Stacy's restaurant using the parking in this uh, facility. That is actually exacerbating the traffic on the street. And that would be part of the reason that we would support gating off this and forcing all of their patrons who park in this lot at night to utilize 7th Avenue to leave. I see. Um, so that would be my biggest point. And the other point I just want to reiterate is I understand that they're talking about a historical right of way, historical easement. I cannot find anything in the, any property's deeds regarding this. So is this a handshake agreement or is this a lifetime guaranteed deeded easement? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Morris, I don't know if you are in a position sure. to talk about the um, legality of the, of the easement that you described. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Mayor, in terms of the access easement, this property was purchased with that easement in place. It's prescriptive easements that have been used for 26 years at this point, and it is part of the title policy that was purchased with the building. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Any additional questions at this time? Mr. Mayor, Chief, do you have a Mayor question or a Mayor, uh, comment, would, please? I would also like to add relative to that, that as part of the development of this project, they will have to submit a site plan that's going to show that access easement. They will have to maintain that pursuant to the zoning requirements in order to continue to do the use. Excellent. Okay. Any additional uh, questions? Is anyone else here in the audience wishing to provide testimony on items 53 and 54? Going once, going twice. Public hearing is now closed. Vice Mayor, it's in your district. I'll hand it over to you to see if you have any motion. Um, I first have a question about the community space. Because <laughs> uh, uh, that piece, um, I, from my understanding and, and from being afar uh, with this uh, case, uh, that there was uh, dialogue about the community space from the very beginning. And so I would like to know uh, regarding the community space, is there community space? Secondly, how will the community be able to access it? Okay, Ms. Morris, uh, you reference community space? I did, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Pastor. I just wanted to give the dimensions of the space. Uh, in this instance, one of the things that was, I mentioned during the design phase, when we reached out to the community, one of the things that was requested from the community was give us something. You know, we, from a, a land use perspective, we understand why you may want a storage facility here, but there also has to be some sort of win for the neighborhood. What does the neighborhood derive from an application like this or a use like this? So amongst the designs in the de design competition was the concept in, in this design of having a community space. Space that would not be programmed for storage use that was at the ground level, in this instance about 2,000 square feet, and that is part of the winning design. That's something that was committed to at the village level. It was referenced, actually we didn't uh, speak to it at the planning commission because it was approved unanimously uh, on a, an expedited schedule. But we have no problem committing to it on the record this evening that there will be that space. It's designed into the, uh, the site plan that is associated with the application. And the, the concept is that this space would be programmed with the help of the community. Obviously, it's going to be privately owned. There will be rules and regulations about how it can be used and when it can be used, and there may be a deposit necessary to use that space, but it is function space that will be available for community uses based upon that. And then I have one more question. Uh, Yapel Park residents uh, 
made a comment stating that they were not invited to any of the community meetings. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Pastor, uh, I have to tell you, I've never had one case with more neighborhood associations in my life. Uh, there seems to be a neighborhood association for every square foot of this one acre, and it, it's a very active and involved community, and I compliment them for that, but uh, oftentimes, there are unofficial associations, there are associations, there are groups, there are communities, and our first indication that there was anyone left in the seven square mile area that hadn't heard about this case, either on social media or direct notification or the site's posting, was at the village hearing. Um, when actually many of the speakers who spoke this evening spoke at the village hearing. And at that time, the development team, specifically myself, availed ourselves of that neighborhood group and said, if we missed you, we're happy to attend your meeting. And I have to give them credit. They have, by far, the best board meetings or, or community meetings of any of the neighborhoods that I've ever attended. And that is to say, they meet on somebody's front porch at a happy hour, and everyone brings something, and we had an opportunity to speak. So I showed up. I think uh, actually some of the community members who spoke today commented that I was brave to show up. But I showed up, bottle of wine in hand, and had an opportunity to speak to the neighbors about this application. I clearly did not make a tremendous impact, but there has been dialogue throughout. I think we're any additional questions? Uh, Alan, one more question. Does the proposed facility meet the requirements for the height waiver? If so, how? Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, yes it does. So the uh, zoning ordinance permits a height waiver to be granted in an area if there's no, nothing material detrimental to the surrounding community and there's other height in the area. And as discussed, there is height both to the south as well as to the east of this uh, parcel. It is within the 7th Avenue Main Street overlay area, which is promoting an, an urban environment and promoting the commercial activities associated with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, Councilman bel- Stark, please. Not to belabor, but it, it's 48 feet at, but there's a peak to 56 feet? No. Because I heard 56, I heard 48. They, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Stark, no, it's 48 feet uh, I th- and some amount of inches, but below 47 feet at its peak. Uh, 56 feet, I think, was the limit of the height waiver that was being requested, but we're going nowhere near that height. Okay. So I will make a motion. Please. I move to pr- approve the rezoning application per the Planning Commission's recommendation and adopt the rate- related ordinance. Are there's a motion? Is there a second on that motion? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the motion? Mayor, from the, from the city council? council. I would just clarify that this is item 53 Z17-7 that you're voting on. Yeah, item 53. Yeah, we'll do a separate vote on item 54 as well. Correct. Okay. So this is item 53 only. We'll do a separate motion on 54. There is a motion. There was a second as well. Again, any additional comments by members of this council? Roll call. The CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Astor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So I believe that item passed unanimously. Thank you for your time. We have a motion on item 54. I move item 54. Vice Mayor, out. Like per the Planning Commission recommendation, adopt the related ordinance. Yes. Move to approve the rezoning application for the Planning Commission's recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. Any comments or questions by members of this council on the motion? Roll call. The CCO. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So 54 passes unanimously. Uh, That's all the formal business. We still have additional citizen comments uh, on for today's agenda. 
Again, citizens have the three minutes to provide comments on non-agendized items. John, is it Jan or John Miller? Are you still here, Mr. Miller or Ms. Miller? All right. Chaya Levine. Good to see you up to three minutes of uh, public comment. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is, oh, this is loud. My name is Shia Levine, and I have a bachelor's degree from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, and a master's degree from Emerson College in Boston. I'm grateful to be speaking here for the third time. I so very much wanted to speak about health care, but I felt the need to reiterate a similar subject as I spoke of in the past, and that's the subject of tailgating and aggressive driving. It seems as though the situation has been slightly tempered somehow, and thank you to whatever forces come into play that do this. The situation still needs to be tempered even further and somehow remain there for as long as people continue to drive and soon drone. I'm here to ask Mayor Stanton to please request again that local radio and TV broadcast the upcoming rendering of $250 to $300 tickets to all those who engage in tailgating and aggressive driving. I'm wondering if this upcoming rendering can be posted on the same signs that list drive hammered and get nailed. I'm wondering if there can be an actual rendering of $250 to $300 tickets to all those who engage in the act of tailgating and aggressive driving. I'm wondering if similar policy can be implemented for those who darken their driver's seat window so much that it's impossible for other drivers to make eye contact. I'm also wondering if there can be regular reminders out there that it's usually the left lane that's the passing lane and not so much the right lane or the middle lane. After speaking here last time, I received a note from the city manager's office stating that there were a handful of roadway citations last year regarding these kinds of issues, yet this is challenging to believe when every single day and virtually every moment many drivers are quick to misbehave. As a yoga practitioner, I don't hesitate to use the word spiritual. It feels like many people have a lot of things that are weighing on their minds, yet instead of choosing to let go and practice some sort of forgiveness, it feels like many people have a tendency to try to project their negativity onto others who are virtually strangers. It needs to be said that not only does this tendency not heal whatever challenges one is facing in one's life, it may cause other challenges. Whenever I see a man engaging in tailgating and aggressive driving, I've come to view it as a version of misogyny. And when I see a woman doing it, I view it as another version of misogyny. I do not see myself as being perfect. Nobody around me is. But I do know that each and every time I get into my vehicle, I am mindful of the exquisite safety of each and every single person around me with an emphasis on the words each and every without discrimination. Please, Mayor Stanton, can you put more unmarked ve police vehicles on the roadway and highway systems to spring up on unsuspecting motorists who are engaging in tailgating and aggressive driving? Thank you so very much for your time. Thanks for your patience and your important testimony here. Thank you. Uh, next speaker will be Pasquale Sabati. Good to see you again. Please come forward. Did you ever remember my name? Labate. The reason I come here today uh, that I got to make an appointment with my uh, council lady, uh, Carrie Gallegos, and resolve the problem I have in my house. Uh, then as, uh, last week, I have to call the Phoenix police because uh, the, uh, um, the, Galle uh, the um, I'm sorry, my neighbor there at, uh, with the uh, clinic in there, uh, La Familia, they uh, blocked the street and uh, everything was at, uh, a mess. I couldn't get out of my house. So the police is will be not uh, testify in a court of appeal what uh, the uh, Ricardo Gallega are doing in front of my house there. It's uh, almost seven months that, uh, that uh, the, um, you, at, uh, you have at, uh, a grant to the um, They've rezoned the property uh, 1529 East of Letter Street. And uh, in May, 
uh, 10, 2017, that you have uh, give it uh, time for people, for the uh, Gallega to uh, uh, restore the mistake, mistakes that they were making in the parking lot in there, and to uh, close the, the uh, driveway on uh, Valletta Street and, and the alleyway, and uh, so they, he did, they did nothing. So therefore, what are we gonna do about it? I don't want to confront anyone, I want to live in peace. So it's your people that uh, responsibility, the city of Phoenix, to take care of people who don't do the job right. If they cannot do the job right, they gotta be out of the way, equipped what they're doing. Now they're closer the, uh, the, um, um, the office they're from the uh, state of Arizona where they have it, uh, uh, the uh, uh, collect the uh, uh, benefits for it. Uh, um, and uh, so it was on 18th Street in um, 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 McKinley. So they closed all those people from there. They're going to go to the, uh, to the uh, um, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, it, uh, uh, Ricardo Celea office in there for a, 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 to a collect the access in there. Now it's in there, they have a tr a trucks, big trucks, small trucks. They have plugged the whole street and nobody can get around in there. Something gotta be done by this office. And I expect that uh, if the Ricardo Celea cannot restore the, the uh, lot that you're rezoning, then uh, rezone it back to R3 the way it was before. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you very much, and I hope that uh, everything is going to be fixed. Thank you for uh, your testimony. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Mr. J.J. Johnson. And then, uh, I don't know, Pat, is Pat, was he able to stay? Mr. Vint, he had to leave, looks like. Uh, how about Mr. Rusnick, is he still available? Looks like he may have had to leave as well. So it'll be J.J. Johnson followed by uh, Reverend Maupin. Mayor, council members, not sure if you can hear me or not. Apparently there was a gentleman that was having some difficulty hearing earlier. Um, I wanted to address a couple of things today. Uh, the first is the after action report, if you will, with, the, with regard to the Burton Bar Library. Uh, I, revered very, I, I read the report that came out very, very carefully, and I have a concern that some city employees, some of them who have uh, had a tenure over 30 years, uh, were essentially scapegoated in the report. The only real consistency with regard to fire prevention was the city manager, the fire chief, and the public safety manager, Mr. Dahoney. Uh, there was so much volatility with regard to Kelvin Barty uh, that he was in the position for a very, very short time. He walked in well, he walked in while things were in flux. Uh, between, uh, after the leadership of Mr. Ballantyne, uh, Mr. Ballantyne, of course, being removed. And we're in a situation where we still don't know if that system has been fixed, and it was not addressed in any way, shape, or form uh, in the disciplinary report. Uh, I take great umbrage that Mr. Barty has been disciplined for 80 hours, um, and nobody can, exp nobody has offered any explanation as to why Chief Kalkbrenner, uh, Milton Dahoney, and of course Ed Zercher have not been disciplined, uh, as they were the ones who uh, ultimately had uh, should have been accountable uh, as far as that goes. The ripple effect of Burton Bar being closed pushed a lot of homeless people out where our neighbors had to look at them. and. I've been in touch with several of you about the population uh, that camped briefly at Roosevelt Point. Uh, you should know that they have been pushed by Phoenix law enforcement all the way to Mesa now, uh, where they are continuing to be arrested and harassed by law enforcement. We need to find a different way to address that population. We have about three solutions for hundreds of different reasons that people are on the street. It's really time for us to look at ourselves as a city and define how we want to be looked at in history. Thank you very kindly.
Thank you very much uh, for coming down and giving that important testimony. Mr. Maupin, Reverend Maupin. And then Dee Dee Barker, is she still here? Good to see you. Um, and then uh, Mr. Dibler will be last. Yeah. Mayor and, and Council, I'll be really quick. I have a petition here and I'll share it with you. you. Um, but to get to the nuts and bolts of it, um, I'm sure you all saw the reports about that terrible apartment complex at 2936 East Van Buren where all the folks were made homeless. Uh, this morning, um, I had seven people. There's a man there named Freddie Green, who's a, an Army Ranger, a veteran, uh, and, and knows my dad. Uh, and, he, and he plays dominoes with my dad. So I had seven of the people who were evicted from there uh, that I had to take to, to breakfast today and then go look at the conditions they were living in. I, I'm not mad at you guys. I come to ask you for three uh, simple things. Um, the first, um, I know that the state regulates you know, the rights of property owners with respect to collecting rents. So I would ask that you uh, send the legislature some kind of a resolution um, urging them to empower you or to further empower themselves to um, prevent uh, property owners who know that their property is nearing condemnation or who know that the city is coming in 48 hours to turn off the electricity and make it uninhabitable uh, to ask them to give, to give you guys some help with that uh, because it's a, it's a terrible situation. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do was applaud neighborhood services um, and just ask that we get a little bit more sensitive uh, with the notice that is given to the property owners and the tenants because the 48 hours isn't, isn't long enough. And I know you guys didn't formally evict anybody, but when you turn the power off to save lives, you still, you know, people still have to make that uh, choice. So if, if you can make it maybe seven days, five days, whatever is reasonable after meeting about it, doesn't matter to me, but I think 48 hours is a little short uh, for the tenants. I really don't give a damn about the property owner, this, these particular people. Uh, and the third thing I wanted was um, with this on, on their behalf, the property owners here, they're bad actors. Neighborhood services, they've got hundreds of fines, and the only thing you can do is civilly fine them. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible. And, uh, you know, my family has some apartment buildings over in that area. They're very clean. Uh, and, I mean, some of the rents are very low, $200, $250 a month. They've been that way since my grandmother owned them in the 70s. They haven't raised the rent. Um, but... Uh, uh, these guys are really bad actors. Uh, you got open sewage lines, you probably know the electrical stuff, the structural issues. I know the city can make them post a sign. And so the third thing I'm asking for is that you, if the property owner won't do it, that the city would come out in the public uh, right away wherever we have space and post signs warning people, and I'll be very quick, uh, Mr. Mayor, Please. warning people that um, that uh, they should not pay rent or deposit monies to these property owners um, who, who have property that's going to be condemned today. Uh, neighborhood Services was with a woman today who the, the property owner, this, this uh, Miss Chin, refused to be served. And I had two or three people that came to me, they don't have the money to file a small claims suit or whatever, uh, and they've lost you know, 200 bucks, but when your monthly income is $750 on social security, uh, what can you do? So we, we've gotta be able to warn people. So I'm hoping there's some creative things that the city can do to fight back against these uh, slumlords because they're terrible. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Maupin. Maybe, Mr. Manager, I can get a briefing on the uh, specifics of what uh, the, what happened at that uh, property. Thank you so much. Thank Dee Dee Barker, you're next, and then uh, Mr. Dibler. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council and City Staff. i Diane Barker, and I reside still downtown Phoenix 7. Um, Mayor, Mayor, I need your attention because you might take a kudo, right? I know that you get the other. Uh, from September of uh, 2015, I remember the mayor saying, this is going to be the last time we have a meeting like this. Our friends at the AG have instructed us, and this is what's happened. I have now the opportunity, if I am fortunate, to be person called at the beginning of the meeting and the end here. 
and I think it's useful. And so I do want to thank you and the council for moving forward with that decision. I see a, a big improvement. It's more of the government that I had envisioned, and um, now I'm at the Board of Supervisors, and I am going to take back what you said, Mayor, today about we can't speak on something that's not on the agenda because I see a violation over there. And I'm hoping that they may look at the way that you just said that our friends at the AG and you move forward in that light because we see different governments that drag their feet and they really don't want to do what their mission is. And the mission in my mind for all of our government basically is in best practices to serve for the public services that's under them. So, you know, I want to thank you. Also, we have pollution problem, and it's not getting better. By Deck Park, westbound, it's seven days a week. And, you know, it's around two, and going to the I-17, which is one of five worst freeways, Mayor, we have to do something about the pollution. The I-60 was held up yesterday, and I'm watching it on TV, and I'm wondering why do all these cars have to be stalled? It's polluting that we can't expedite somebody to get around the incident of which they've had to secure. But to keep people waiting for hours, it's not good. It's not healthy. And so you sit on boards. Let's move this traffic. I've asked the Board of Supervisors to do that also. And um, so I'm just you know, finally saying here that I'd like to see the city put on their big agenda for all the departments, what they can do to adhere to some goals they may have made or create goals for fitness. I see that, uh, you know, there's a saying, make America fit again, okay? If it was, you know, when I was growing up, it was really, shown, uh, if you were overweight, the, the people really didn't like that. And if you worked for the airlines and you uh, were what the thing they called that uh, stewardess, two pounds over, you couldn't fly, okay? You, they, you didn't have a job that day. I think very much. I think it's illegal now. Mr. Dabler. Hello, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, in Council District 5. I know Phoenix is a fast-growing city with lowest unemployment, unemployment rate in the nation. We need a new sports arena for the Phoenix Suns and Arizona Coyotes in downtown Phoenix without using taxpayers' money. We need to improve the economy in downtown Phoenix with new job, job opportunities that people enjoyed. Finally, we need to make college more affordable for students without taking out student loans. I know student loans is a big time killer that disqualify people to get a house, home, or car. Thanks for no time and consideration. Thank, thanks for the time and consideration. Today is my birthday. Thank you very much, Mr. Dibler. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thanks for being such an active citizen. It's Thank appreciated. You. No other comments uh, for citizen comment? This meeting is adjourned.